Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Chris Austin. I'm the pastor of our 528 campus. Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we are so glad you joined us here to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe that life is better when we do it together. So when we gather as a church, it's a non-downloadable experience. Singing together, praying together, serving together are all things that just, they don't translate online but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you, make plans to check out the campus nearest you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us at clearcreek.org to find information about our locations, service times, and much more. We hope to see you soon. All right, let me, let me just start off this message with a confession. There's sometimes when I'm in a crowded place where... I'm really not as gracious as I want to be. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I like to, uh, with my wife, she and I, we like to uh, do grocery shopping together, just something where we can spend some time uh, with each other. But there are often times where I'm just there by myself to pick up something really quick, and the place is packed. And I'm, I'm not, I don't, believe it or not, don't really like crowds. I'm not a real big crowd person. I don't go to the mall. I rarely go to movies. I don't like any places that's got a lot of, a lot of you know, congestion. And so uh, oftentimes when I'm at the grocery store, it's just like that. And so, again, I, I'm going through and grabbing like three or four items, and I'm getting out of there. And so I'll just go to self-checkout. But sometimes self-checkout's just as bad as anything else because everyone else, like me, has got three to four items. They're just backed up in a line with self-checkout. And so then what I'll start to do is I'll look at all the little, you know, the aisles where all the uh, cashiers are, and I'll look for the shortest one. I know I'm the only guy that does that, but I'll look for the shortest one. And invariably, when I do that, I'll see someone who's also looking for the shortest aisle, and we'll start moving at the same time. Now, this is where I ask myself, like, what would Jesus do? And I, I think to myself... Listen, Jesus never shopped at H-E-B. Run, Forrest, run. So I'm just running. So I get there, and I'm like, but I, even as, as, as fast, or I guess as slow as I am, we get there at the same time. <clears throat> and I know I need to be more gracious and think about other people. And this is where you'd think Pastor Yancey Arrington would say, hey, man, go ahead, go ahead. But see, here's what happens. What I want him to do, just imagine it's a guy, is usually what happens is this. I've got you know my three to four items. I want him to look at his his full cart of stuff. Looks like he's going to stock a bomb shelter. He's got so much stuff there. And I want him to look at my avocado loaf of bread and my cigarettes. And I just want to go, sorry, I don't know why you're laughing. It's my wife. She's a chimney at home. So she's not here. Don't tell her that. Um, and I want, it, I want the guy to go, oh, dude, you go first, bro. You go first. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Thanks. How kind of you. I only have three things. It's obvious. Uh, but he doesn't do that. And so like sometimes... People do the right thing. And then uh, other times, people deserve to have all their eggs broken in those egg carts when they get home. That's how I feel about it. Now, listen, I tell you that story not because it's a point of I'm, what, I, what, I, what I usually do. What I'm trying to share with you and confess with you this morning is what I, what I often do, especially when I, I'm in places where I want to just get out of somewhere. I, I tend to think about myself, about what I want. I'm not really concerned about other people. I'm not trying to be mean or nasty. I just... I just want to get in and get out. But what happens is I wind up being more selfish and less selfless because of it all. And that, that kind of attitude uh, is something that I can struggle with a lot. And it feels like in this culture, our culture just greases the wheels for selfishness. It not only just celebrates the fact that I'm selfish, it pats me on the back and says, way to go, Yancey, keep doing more of that. Now, that's a problem as a follower of Jesus, and I even think just as a human being, because I think deep down inside... Most people, if you kind of just pop the hood and get on the essence of who they are, most people want to live for something bigger than themselves. Most people want to be a part of a bigger story. Most people want to have something that has some depth and some substance to it where they make a difference for the long haul. And that's why maybe even some of you are here at church. Like You don't know much about Jesus or the whole God thing, but you kind of feel like your life's fairly thin. And so you're like, I'm just going to give this whole God thing a chance because I don't have a sense of, you might not use the word, but you, you just don't have a sense of transcendence in your life. Something bigger worth living for than waking up and you know, going to work and coming home and waking up and going to work and coming home and doing that whole kind of rigmarole. And that's all that you got. And so you're here, right? And then 
you come to church services and you do church services for a while and you still feel like, gosh, I just, there's not really much happening. I haven't done much. I come, I listen, I, I, might, I might even sing, maybe pray, and then I walk out the door and go back to my going to work and going to sleep and going to work and going to sleep, and I don't know if there's much change at all. So maybe this, maybe this whole God thing is not as cracked up as it, as it seems to be. And So what's going on? And Maybe the bigger question is for people that are like that, or maybe you or you're thinking, um, is, there, is there something worth living for, something I can do to make my life a bigger story that lasts longer than just me? Or is, or is just church services and these kinds of things are just another, just another dead end? Well, I'm glad you asked, because uh, if you have a Bible, I would love for you to turn with me in chapter uh, 4 of 1 Peter. So if you're looking at 1 Peter, it's on the back half of that big, thick Bible that you have, this thing called the New Testament on the back half. You've got 1 Peter and 2 Peter. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4. If you have it on your, you know, dial it up on your Bible app, chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. <clears throat> and I want you to see what the Apostle Peter teaches the church in the first century about what it means to, to live in light of you know, the kingdom of God and what that means for us as it concerns uh, being selfless or being selfish. And uh, I hope to explain that a little bit more. So let's do this. Do this. If you have that Bible, look with me in verse 7. If you didn't bring a Bible, no big deal. We're going to put it on the screens so you can read. Uh, so uh, we'll look at verse 7 right now. First Peter 4, verse 7. Peter writes, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now, Peter starts out with this statement not because he's in the prediction business. He's not just saying, you know, he's, he's talking about like the, the end of all things and the return of Jesus. And the reason that he talks about this, when he's like, oh, the end of all things is at hand. We're here at the last days, is because of this. Um, he knows that Jesus has died and been resurrected. And the next big shoe to drop that he's looking for is the return of Jesus. So in this time between the resurrection of Jesus and the return of Jesus, he's like, those are the last days. By the way, that, that's how the Bible teaches the last days. If you were with us in our Revelation series, uh, the Bible does teach from the resurrection on. So the, the era that we're in is called the last days. And so what does he say about that, right? Now you think he'd say, ah, it's the last days, man. Max out your credit cards. Eat all you want. You know, do whatever you want to do. But he doesn't say that at all. In fact, as you look at the text, he's saying here, like, um, be self-controlled and sober-minded. In other words, he's like, you should do those things because you need to be a people of prayer. You need to be really connected with God in this era between the resurrection and the return. Now, you may go, oh, that's, that kind of seems anticlimactic. I mean, be sober-minded and self-controlled and you know, be prayerful, be close to God. But that's not all that he says here. He's like, listen, if, if, if you want to live in a way that makes a difference in this era between the resurrection and the return of Jesus. Uh, you, you need to be very connected to God, and not just connected to God, you need to be really connected to others, God's community. Watch this. Let's look at verses 8 through 10 here. <clears throat> above all, so in addition to that, above all of this stuff, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling and as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now, just look at that screen for a second. How many one another's do you see up there? You should see three. And there, it says that we're to love one another, we're to be hospitable to one another, and then we're also to serve one another. Now, that gives us a really big hint on how Peter thinks Followers of Jesus should live in this era between the resurrection and the return of Jesus. In other words, what he's saying is that in addition to being as close as you can to God and being sober-minded and self-controlled, uh, to be prayerful with the Lord, that you ought to be connected to God's community, the one in which Christ died for to create. And so not only do we need to add self-controlled and sober-mindedness, but we need to also be kind of others-focused, radically others-focused. And see, this is where, when I read this stuff, this is where Peter gets into my kitchen. Uh, because I've told you, and I'll say it again, I, my, my sin pattern is this. I, I'd rather do things for me. I'd rather have my calendar wrapped around my desires. I'd, I'd, I'd rather it just be my will, me, myself, and I. Like I like being in control. All of those things I, I tend to like. And Peter's like, well, you if you want to live in a way that makes a difference, Chance, 
It's not just living for God, it's, it's also connecting with God's people, being radically others-focused there. Like if, if I want to live for a bigger story, if I want to have some thickness in my life, if I, if I want to make a dent and a difference in this world between the resurrection and the return, well, then I, I can't just be saying my prayers and being close with God in Christ. I need to be with God's people in Christ and be radically focused on them. See, the problem arises, at least for me, is when I start to treat church like I treat my grocery store. It's just one more place where I can get my desires filled and, and my will done and my wishes uh, granted and my needs met. So in other words, like when my basket's full and then, then I just I, I take off. And I know people, uh, and I'm not trying to dog anyone in this room, I'm just simply saying I know there are a lot of people that they might not think of it that way, but they, they even treat church and church services like that. I mean, it's, it's, um, they, they come in and they listen, whether it's to me, teach, or to someone else, or they, they, they want to sing, and maybe they, maybe they want to pray, but whatever they do, they come in just for enough for what they can get. So once they fill their own basket, they're, they're ready to take off. I mean, we'll even have people take off before the service is even over, because it's not about the other people. It's just saying, it's just about me. It's just something I want to do. Like, my need has been met. I got my avocados, my cigarettes, whatever. It's probably a bad analogy now. I've got all this stuff, and I'm, I'm ready to head to check out and go. I got, a, I got a full day of doing things. And I'm just starting to think to myself, like, that's, that's the opposite of what Peter is saying here. And then we wonder when we, when we do those kinds of things, why being a part of a church feels so insignificant. While it feels so, why it feels so thin, while it just feels like one more category of a box of things that you're doing this week, and it's not something you are, it's just something you do, and maybe you just do it for 52 minutes and so you can get out and go. That's it, right? Instead of being a place that Peter says, hey, listen, if you want a life that makes a difference between the return, excuse me, the resurrection and the return, it's one that's devoted prayerfully and following God in Christ and also committed to serving others within the community of Christ. And don't overlook how big of a deal that is. I mean, we're gonna, let's go back to the text, <clears throat> excuse me, and let's look at verses 10 and 11. Because what Peter's going to say here, we're going to read it here, is that serving within God's community is how we live out, one of the ways we live, live out being a part of a bigger story. So let's go look at verse 10. As each has received a gift... Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. And notice how he adds to this in verse 11. Ah, oh, whoever speaks. The idea is let him do so as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Why? In order that in everything God might be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong <clears throat> glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So this is very simple. Peter says in this text, right? That each of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, that, that you have received spiritual gifts. Now, there's a big debate. Like, do you have all the spiritual gifts that you're ever going to get at your conversion? Like, when you came to Jesus, the Holy Spirit imparts gifts to you, as we see in 1 Corinthians. And the question is, can, can you get any more? I, I'm not even here to debate that you can add some on. I think you can. I don't know, like, how many everyone has. All, all I do know is this. Everyone... <clears throat> has at least one, and I would argue probably more, spiritual gifts that God has given you for the express purpose of serving the body. And I would add on top of gifts, not only do you have gifts to serve the body, but you've got a whole kind of uh, profile and repertoire to serve the body. You have experiences, good and bad. You'd be surprised how many bad experiences that have happened to us. We can, we can leverage those to serve other people who are also going through those kinds of same experiences. So experiences, uh, you have wisdom, uh, you have talents in addition to gifts, you have insights, you have education, you have all kinds of things that bring in this kind of matrix of making you someone who can bring an impact to others within God's people. And all of those things, you put them together and you start to serve. And here's what will hap happen. <clears throat> God's giftedness is, is to show you what God's assignment is for you. God's giftedness to you helps see God's assignment or assignments for you within his kingdom. People ask me all the time. Let me, let me kind of follow up with that. People ask me all the time <clears throat> throughout the years I've been here. Yancey, um, I'm really trying to seek out God's will in my life. What's God's will in my life? Because everyone wants to know what God's will, and I, I, I think that's probably a good thing to want to know. Listen, here's what I would say as it concerns the topic at hand today. 
I don't know who you're supposed to marry, young guys and young gals. Uh, I, I don't know how many kids you're supposed to have. I don't know God's will for you in that matter. I don't, I don't know God's will for you on what kind of job you're supposed to have or how long you're supposed to have it. I, I don't know God's will on if the Texans will ever have a winning season and go to the Super Bowl. I don't know. I wish I knew it. I don't. But here's what I do know. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's God's will that you serve using your gifts within the body of Christ. And the reason I know that is because the text of Scripture keeps repeating that refrain. It sings that chorus time and time and time again. If it's not 1 Corinthians, it's here now in 1 Peter. God gave you gifts, each one of you gifts, to serve the body of Christ. And that service can look in a thousand different ways. I'm just simply saying those gifts show part of your assignment or assignments that he's given specifically and explicitly to you in order that you might know his will, in order that you might know how to live in a way that's deep and fulfilling between the resurrection and the return of Jesus. Now, if you look at that text, <clears throat> uh, specifically in verse 11, Paul highlights a couple of those gifts in general terms. He says, speaking and serving. Now notice ver verse 11, whoever speaks. Now that could be anything, speaking. Like for us at Clear Creek, that could be teaching a Creek Kids class, uh, that could be navigating a small group, or it could be like what I'm doing right now. I don't know why I had to pop my call like I was doing. Or it could be doing what I'm doing right now, preaching, right? Uh, the second thing he says there is he says, uh, one, two, three, four, like the one, fifth line, those who serve, if you serve. <clears throat> now, serving for us, we've already talked about it today. It could be like the parking team. Serving could be ushers, greeters, coffee, people that distribute the Lord's Supper elements. I mean, they have people that are uh, right now on uh, the back there, doing the sound and the lights, all that kind of stuff, that, that's all serving. But what I want you to catch is this, as you look at these, as you look at this, what, what, what Peter is saying here is that using speaking and serving, it's almost like umbrella terms for any kind of use of your giftedness, any kind of exercise of your gifts. Now, what I love about what he says in this text is, is this. He doesn't just say, listen, whether it's like speaking gifts or serving gifts, just use your gifts. That's not what he says. Let's look at the text again. He says, if you speak, do so like you're speaking the very words of God, the oracles of God, the promises, the prophecies, the, like you're speaking for God. And if you're serving, you're not just serving. That's what it says. You're doing so by the strength that God supplies. Like you're, you're doing all of this. Why? Because like you, you want to be able to do whatever gifting that you're doing, using whatever gift you're doing, in whatever kind of service that you're doing, whether it's speaking or serving, whatever it looks like. You, like, you want to do so in a way like acknowledging the mystery of the fact that God's not just working in you to do these things, though he is. He's working through you to do these things. Like that's, that's the cool part. That's where you get a little bit bigger in your story. Like you can just go put your head on the pillow at night going, you know what today what happened? God worked in me and through me, not because I'm fancy, but because he says in the text that whenever I serve the body of Christ, God's going to by his spirit work in me to use my gifts, and to work through me to impact other people. Like, what else can you do that gives you that kind of satisfaction? And what, 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 what Peter's trying to tell the church 21 centuries ago is like, serving the body is one of those ways. Like, it's at least, at least one way that you can know that you're fulfilling your design, that you're fulfilling your purpose, that you're leaving a legacy that will far outlive you more, uh, more often than not. And in doing so... <clears throat> Your life finally gets to have the kind of depth that God always created it to have and the kind of breadth that it needs to have and the kind of significance it needs to have. And now it's not a little life living a little story, but a life living in the grander story that lasts forever and ever and ever. Notice how Peter ends this text, not with us, but with God. Why do we do all this stuff? See the little dash there on the fourth line from the bottom at the very end? It says, we do this, why? In order... That in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And then Peter just can't stop the worship service going on. He says, to him, to God in Christ, belong, gl belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So like doing things for God by serving God's people makes them lasting by default of simply of who God is. He's the one who lasts forever and ever Amen. So now when we're serving other people, using our gifts and talents and wisdom and knowledge and experiences, everything else I've kind of talked about and enumerated, when we do those to try to serve the body of Christ, 
there we have something that will last far beyond us, that's eternal. Like That's the impact that we get to have. That's the legacy we get to leave. Now listen, <clears throat> let me share with you kind of an analogy for this that I hopefully can, can put some skin on what I'm talking about. <clears throat> uh, let's see, a couple of weeks ago, Ryan Layton, and if you guys don't know him, Ryan Layton is our campus pastor at our Egret Bay campus, our original campus there off of, uh, there in League City. Uh, he, a couple of weeks ago, came back with his family. They went to Telluride, Colorado. Anyone been to Telluride, by the way? Anybody raise your hand? Okay, fancy people. So, um, <clears throat> I'm just jealous. <clears throat> Especially right now, I'm jealous. <laughs> it's 5,000 degrees outside. Uh, so, he's at Telluride with his wife and uh, Lindsay and their kids. And, you know, they're doing camping and do all this kind of stuff. Well, they kind of have a neighbor next to them, <clears throat> a guy named George. And they just start talking, and George asks, like, hey, what are you doing today? And Ryan's like, well, we're just going to kind of go around and kind of see the mountain and hillside. And what are you going to do today, George? And George's like, we're going to do the, we're going to do the Via Ferrata, <clears throat> the Via Ferrata. And uh, so, of course, Ryan's like, I don't, I don't know what the Via Ferrata is. What's the Via Ferrata? And George is like, well, listen, uh, if you go to this, you know, there's this kind of big mountain right at Telluride, and uh, it's kind of like this sheer face cliff where it's got this, uh, I, mean, I should say, uh, this rock face, it's about a 500-foot drop. And when you look at it, it's so amazing to look at. But if you look, if you peer a little closer, you can see that there are uh, iron anchors for your hands and iron anchors for your feet that you can, if you get kind of a, uh, some suspension, you can kind of shimmy across from one side of the mountain face to the other. And it's just a sheer drop all the way <clears throat> below. In fact... I'll show you a picture of the Via Ferrata. Here's, here's what that looks like. <clears throat> Y'all ready to do that? Ready to do that? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so uh, settle down. It's just a photo. Um, so just, I want you to catch it. We're going to leave it on here for a second because I, I want to point something out. Now, notice, like, those people, uh, first of all, are crazy. Secondly, uh, you can look. If you peer close enough, you can see these iron anchors where their hands are holding and iron anchors for their, as, as footholds. Now, that's all they got outside of, some, excuse me, of, a, of a cord that they're kind of clipping in and clipping out. Now, via ferrata is Italian for, if you will, the iron way or the iron path. I thought it was Italian for I just peed myself. That's what I would do. And I'm being nice. I would have used other language had I been out in Colorado. Uh, but I'm telling you this. Had he showed me that, and I was with, and I was, it was not Ryan, it was me with George. I'd have been like, I pull a good drag on those carton of cigarettes. I got like, hey kids, we're going to HEB. That's all we're going to do. <laughs> Listen, some of you are like, this pastor is totally messed up. You're like, yeah, he is. That's why he needs Jesus. So, <clears throat> you know, think about this for a second. Think about this as we see this photo. <clears throat> What's even crazier than the fact that thousands of people, have gone on the Via Ferrata at Telluride doing just what you're seeing on those screens as they shimmy across this 500-foot drop of a wall is to know that someone had to go put up those iron anchors <clears throat> without any suspension and do it by their lonesome. And you think, my gosh, who would have done that? And, and I'll tell you, there was a guy named Chuck Kroger. Ironically, <laughs> Chuck Kroger, ironically, a guy with the grocery name in there as I... This is perfect illustrations. They're all working out today. Um, guy named Chuck Kroger went up there without anything, no suspension, and hammered in all those anchors. Now, just, I mean, he, he loved it enough. He, he literally went out on a ledge and hammered all those anchors for people. And he uses his, used his gift in this because he said, and he wanted, I should say, he desired that people. If they wanted to experience the glory and awe of the mountain, would have a place to do so, but they wouldn't do it unless he got up there and laid those first anchors in that he hammered. All right, you can put that down because no one's going to listen to what I say. They're going to keep looking at that. There you go. <clears throat> now, think about this. Kroger died of cancer, bone cancer, I believe, in 2007, so a little bit ago, and yet the legacy of his service lives on. I mean, literally today, you can get on the Via Ferrata that we just saw there, right? And people can experience the majesty and wonder of, a, of the mountain at Telluride simply because they're, they're walk, literally walking upon the anchors and holding upon the anchors, these iron anchors that this gentleman hammered in 
years ago. Now, the reason I give you this story is because this is how I feel when I come to places like Clear Creek Community Church, when I come to the 528 campus or the East 96 campus or Clear Lake campus or Wednesday night campus or Eager Bay campus. I, I, I realize this. For those of you who serve, like whether that's teaching at Creek Kids or you're parking cars outside or you're turning knobs to make the lights turn on or the sound just right or you're even kind of wiping rear ends over there and creek kids with the babies and putting on diapers and all all of that you know what how I feel about that you're hammering anchors you're just hammering anchors you're hammering anchors for people that are that are coming to try to experience the wonder and awe and majesty of who God is in Christ. Way bigger and way better than a mountain. Like you're, you're, you're creating for them places to go and experiences to have and a grace that can meet them in the moment by the Spirit so that they can know the majesty and wonder and awe of, of Christ, of the goodness of the gospel. And to do so in a way that will far outlive even your own ex life and experiences. Like there's going to be some people, I believe, when we all die, and that's always a great way to start, when we all die, when we're all dead, when we all die or Christ returns, however we get to the kingdom quickest, I have this sense in me that there are going to be people that you meet in the kingdom that came into the kingdom of God at some point because of what you did. And it's going to be like, it's going to be a team effort. Like some people may share a story with you like, you know what, I came into this kingdom, I believed in the king because I was desperate one day, I was dying, I thought I was going to put a gun to my head and take my own life, but I decided, you know, I'll give this church a shot. So I just drove down 528, saw this building, came in, and it was packed, but some guy helped me find a parking spot, then someone walked in and helped me with like getting into this place, and someone took my kid so they could be taken care of, and then I heard like with lights and sound and everything else, people singing and people praying and people weeping and people laughing and someone delivering this thing about Jesus and all of a sudden I became a follower of Jesus and that happened, I don't know, 7,000 years ago. I'm glad we just now met in the kingdom but I want to let you know thanks for being a part of that. So that's someone hammering an anchor or anchors that someone got to experience way down the road. There's going to be people, I'm telling you this, there's going to be people that we meet in the kingdom that, that, that it wasn't what we did when an anchor that we hammered that they'll make an impact on their life, it's going to be like we're going to have people that we impacted that go impact someone else that we'll never see, never know, never touch. Like It's going to have this cascading ripple effect because of what happens here. Not because of what I do. I'm just one more, I'm just one more place where I've hammered an anchor. I'm just doing it through teaching and preaching because that's how God's gifted me. But you guys have all kinds of gifts as well. And the question is, like, are you hammering anchors? Because I'm telling you, there's a huge difference here. And hammering anchors is a huge critical piece to finding a life that's bigger than just you. That's broader and deeper and lasting that makes a dent when you're long gone. Because God uses it for his kingdom and for his end. So maybe the question I want to conclude with this today is, um, maybe it's just this. Who are you hammering anchors for? And how are you doing it? Now, that's not meant to be a guilt trip. It really is. Just a question, right? And if it's no one right now, like, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing anything, Nancy. I come, sit down, leave, and that's it. I, I get it, man. Everything's a process. But, but maybe, maybe the Lord by His Spirit is working on your heart today going, you know what? I ought to, I ought to pick up my gear and go get up on the mountainside. Like, I ought to take my anchors and go find my place or places, and I'm just going to dig in and start hammering. And, and, and maybe for some people, uh, well, let me, just, let me just say it this way. It's, it's no secret uh, that since we've opened this building here that we've had a lot of people here, a ton of people here. And, you know, I know the media, and, and I think studies have shown, I'm not trying to dog the media, although there's a lot of things worth dogging in it. I'm not trying to dog them. I'm saying this, that there's a lot of talk that you hear today about how the church is dwindling and we're living in a post-Christian society. And, and frankly, I think there's a lot of good to that because then we'll see the, the, the contenders from the pretenders and separate that. The church can live more purely and more on mission. But I'll tell you this, at least for Clear Creek, and, and this is not a brag, this is just thanks be to God, like we, we've seen all kinds of growth lately in all of our campuses. Uh, and I'd like to think God's doing a renewal and revival. I'm just going to just, just take whatever grace that we can give. And for, for Clear Creek, we've just found phenomenal growth. So if I'm just thinking about 528, dude, 528's packed all the time. 
Like every service that we have is just full. And you know that when you have cars going down 520 just trying to get into this place. And so we have all kinds of, um, all kinds of places where we're hammering as many anchors as we possibly can. Like we filled up our parking lot, and now we're parking out on the grass and the gravel. Like we're trying to think in real time, how do we solve these problems? And so what that means is like, it's almost like all hands on deck. Let's try to do as much as we can. So we, so we have like first impressions out there trying to grow our parking team, or we've got like so many kids. I don't know how these, oh, I do know how this happens. I don't want to describe that. We'll have slides later. Um, <laughs> We got so many kids on all of our campuses, like babies on up, right? And we, we have this wonderful children's ministry, but we're, we're tapped out with children's ministry. Do you know that in our campuses, and I think it's happened here too, that we have to close, by, by law, we can only have so many children in with so many adults. That's, just, that's just, a, just a legal thing. And so like we have a policy for us that when you have X amount of kids, uh, the ratio to adults, that we just, we just shut it off. And what, what the hard thing is, is that, People don't understand that. So you, you bring a friend, and they bring their family, and you come, I don't know, 10 minutes late because that's on time to you. Um, and then you, you walk in and like, hey, man, why is this thing closed off? Because we're full. Well, I thought y'all loved Jesus. We do. We also don't want to be persecuted by the authorities for something we didn't need to do, right? So we, we want to be responsible. You know, we're not stacking kids like Cordwood over there where they're like, I can't breathe. We don't want that, right? Uh, so like... Another place that we need to grow is we need to have more people serving in, in Creek Kids. Like, I, I even see people in the room right here with their Creek Kids shirts on. They're trying to, like, help you. Like, hey, look, see all these green shirts? We need, like, to double that. The list goes on and on. Have you all noticed that our student ministry is packed out? Our student ministry is, like, the biggest thing going on right now in this area. Um, we, we just, listen, we need all hands on deck. And I even hate to say it like that because I, I don't want you to do it just for Clear Creek. I want you to do it for you. I want you to live with a greater sense and a bigger story. And that between the, re the resurrection and the return of Jesus, the last days that we happen to be in, Peter's like, there's just one way to live. And of that way to live, a big part of that is being radically focused on others. To not treat, well, I'll say it this way. We have over 700 volunteers, 700 people that serve in different ministries at Clear Creek Community Church just at this campus. 700 plus. That's 700 people that don't treat the church like I treat my local grocery store that they're wiping rear ends or they're parking cars or they're distributing elements or they're lighting up the lights and turning up the sound or they're doing the slides or they're singing songs or whatever it is, right, that they've, they've committed to do this. That's 700 people committed to, committed to hammering anchors. So where instead of it just being one more place to do one more thing of one more box to check, it's a place where I can experience not only God working in me, but God working through me. Like I can let people see the mountain of God's goodness and grace in Jesus by hammering the anchors of what God's designed me for and called me for and equipped me for now until I die and then I'll last far beyond me. Wow. So maybe, maybe we do this. We consider living out a life not just for us, but for the sake of others, why? So that, quote, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for the goodness of the day. Lord, I, let me just say this. Uh, I mean, as we talk about that today we focused on service, can I just, Lord, would you just bless? Um, I, I specifically want to highlight the 700 plus folks right now. Um, in this room, uh, right now in Creek Kids, uh, some of them are out in the parking lot, some out in the lobby getting stuff set up. Um, would you bless every soul that has already been serving here? That, that, that they're not doing that to earn favor with you, to kind of buy a blessing. Like we, do, we just don't believe, God, that's how you work. Like You just give grace to us because you're just a good God. Lord, would you give them even more grace? Would you just... Maybe today with this message, and I'm, not, I'm just talking to the people that are already, they've already kind of drunk the Kool-Aid. man. They're, they've already, they're already in. They already believe that this is worth doing because they've been doing it. Lord, would you just bless them today? Would you just let today's message just remind them that, this, that, that their service makes you smile? 
and much more beyond makes you smile. It, it, it brings you glory and honor forever and ever. And we say, amen, let that be so. And Lord, I pray that, that this would be a heart reminder for them to encourage them to keep going, that they would have a sense and an openness to your work in them. And Lord, please, uh, by your spirit, would you give them little snippets and signposts of how they're making an impact? I, I wish I could tell every one of them, like, how much and how many people are going to be affected and impacted for the gospel because of how they're serving. And I don't have that knowledge. I wish I could give it to them. But Lord, I pray that you would encourage them. And now, Lord, there are folks in this room that um, they're just at different stages. And maybe they're just starting. They don't, they don't know any of this stuff. And Lord, I, I just pray that by your spirit, you would not, we're not guilt tripping, Lord. I just pray that you would give them a good sense of conviction. Like, yes, you've gifted me. And I'm not even sure what all those gifts are. I just need to jump in the pool and start swimming with others and to see what it's like to live for someone beyond myself. So, Lord, I pray that you would encourage them to just take a chance. Just take a chance to grab some anchors and a hammer and just give it a shot so that we might not only experience your goodness, but be able to be a conduit of your goodness towards others now <laughs> between the resurrection and your return, at least the return of your son. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We pray that and ask that you would work in us and through us for your good, for our good, I should say, in your glory. In Christ's name, amen.